I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Grant Newsham, a corporate and government advisor and lecturer on Asia-Pacific defense matters and the business risks posed by organized crime, money laundering, and political instability. Grant currently serves as a senior research fellow at the Japan Forum for Strategic Studies and has prior experience in risk management for Morgan Stanley Japan, security management Motorola Japan, and U.S. foreign service work in Washington, D.C. and Tokyo. Grant retired at the rank of colonel in 2014 following a 30-year career in the United States Marine Corps Reserve and holds a Juris Doctorate from UCLA. So, Grant, welcome back. And before anything else, let me thank you once again for your career of service to our country, sir. No, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So I want to start out with your book once again, When China Attacks, A Warning to America. Last time we spoke, you introduced this book for the audience. I want to reintroduce that for people get them back into it. I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes. Could you tell us a little bit about the book and why people need to be reading this? Sure. It's a book, you know, really that explains to people, let's say the people who don't live and breathe Asian affairs or foreign policy, uh, what's the big deal with China? You know, everybody hears these days, China's a problem, a threat, we need to do something about it. And what I try to do is to explain this uh, in terms that I can understand, sort of how we got to the situation we're in where China is indeed a threat. I know how could this have happened? And I try to lay that out and also explain what to do about it. And you'll note that the, the title of the book is actually has a dual meaning, at least. And one of those is that a few, when China attacks, perhaps in the future, um, but what I'm really getting at and the book lays out is how the Chinese have been attacking us for at least the last 30 years. Uh, the Chinese concept of war is very different than ours. You know, we look at it as a, say a hundred yard dash where you know the two two sides line up or the, the runners line up at the start line, sort of shake loose and then the starter fires a gun and off you go and then the the wars and the, the race is on. And we consider that unless there's shooting that you're not really at war. And the Chinese see it very differently, whereas the shooting is really just the last part if you even need it. So we've been attacked on a number of different fronts, uh, they, you know, put all of all of which fall into the, the rubric of political warfare. So consider you know, the economic attacks we face, those financial attacks, uh, biological warfare. Uh, the, the COVID virus definitely came from Wuhan, China. Uh, how it was seeded, whether intentionally or uh, opportunistically, could be debated. But there's no question where it came from or its effects. And the Chinese do have a very aggressive uh, complex biological warfare uh, research program going on. Uh, chemical warfare, the fentanyl that comes from China, killed 70,000 Americans last year. Uh, cyber warfare, cyber attacks, cyber scouting that's been taking place, uh, espionage, uh, uh, political warfare, as I said, but also buying off American elites, uh, Wall Street, the business class. That to the Chinese is all warfare. As you're softening up, weakening your opponent, to the point where if the, the shooting part is necessary, well, the opponent may not be able to respond very well if it can respond at all. So that's the what I'm trying to get across is that we're looking, we have a mindset as to what a war is, what the Chinese are doing. And the Chinese see things very differently. And they see it, the, the war has started and it's going pretty nicely for them. Well, and again, the book is called When China Attacks, A Warning to America. Now, before we go further, I do want to delineate for the audience that we're discussing the Chinese Communist Party. We're not casting aspersions at the Chinese people. China has a wonderful culture and a brilliant, hardworking people who deserve our respect. What we're discussing today really are national tensions, geopolitical tensions at a governmental and military scale, right? Well, that's true, but it's also, I think, important to remember that these, there's human actors involved here. Yeah. Uh, this isn't like a concept of international relations theory that is causing us trouble or that is uh, doing things that are not good, but rather these are human beings and uh, it just happens to be there in China with the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but as you said, it's important to keep that distinction in mind, uh, that it's not a blanket sort of aspersion on China. 
but certainly the what we've seen manifested on, on by China under the control of the Chinese Communist Party and its leaders and some of the people in it, uh, that is a problem. And one can't distinguish the sort of the human aspect uh, of this. So, I, so both of these points are, I think, important uh, to make. Well, in terms of these international tensions, they remain high in the Taiwan Strait. I read about yet another incident of a Chinese destroyer closely shadowing an American vessel that was passaging the strait just a few days ago online. Do these aggressive maneuvers increase the risk of an international incident? Oh, definitely. It's just a miracle there hasn't been one one yet. Or say it's, these are always incidents, but it's nobody's been killed yet. And that yeah. is the miracle. Uh, Chinese ships have actually been shadowing American ships for years, not just in the Taiwan Strait, but also in the South China Sea. And this is really nothing new. And so, but we've been uh, able to see what China's intentions are by its behavior. Uh, and so you do see it, uh, particularly in the, the seas close to closer to China with the South China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, the Sea of Japan. Uh, it's almost as if the Chinese are looking for a fight. And I think they wouldn't mind, actually, if somebody fired a shot, which would give them an excuse to really move. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's really nothing new. It's been going on a long time. Uh, you'll notice the Americans often say, well, we can go wherever we want and nobody can do anything about it. But it's uh, there's a bit of braggadocio there now because right? it uh, reminds one of back in New York City. You know, if you went to I remember going to Times Square back before Rudy Giuliani cleaned it up. You know, NYPD would send a squad car through Times Square. Uh, the the bad guys would sort of part, the seas would part, and uh, NYP, the, the squad car controlled whatever area it was in, whatever physical space it occupied. But then once it left, you knew who ran Times Square. You know, the bad guys closed up. And that's one way to look at what's going on in the South China Sea. Actually, the, the People's Republic of China has, in fact, had de facto control of the South China Sea, uh, which is international waters. That needs to be pointed out. It always has been. Uh, they've had that for at least six or seven years. So yes, we can go in there. And the Chinese kind of part and let us go through. Uh, but once we're not there, well, it, we know who runs the show down there. And you find that they're shadowing. It's getting to the point where they will call it escorting and letting the Americans come in with permission. Uh, we may not see it that way. We bristle at that, uh, but it's getting to that point. Uh, and, you know, the, the trend is not favorable. Okay. Well, let's get into the military buildup that's going on. This is something that you have been discussing on your LinkedIn feed, and I will put a link into that as well. Japan Forward recently wrote an article discussing the U.S. Department of Defense annual report on military and security developments involving China which revised the estimate of Chinese nuclear weapons upward to 500 warheads. This is up from an estimate of only 300 warheads only a few years ago, and it is expected to exceed 1,000 warheads in the next seven years. Uh, so this is a dramatic increase in nuclear capability in a very short period of time. Would you consider this to be a deterrent? Is that why they're building so many of these so rapidly? Uh, not really. It, it is a deterrent, of course, anytime you have nuclear weapons that uh, you can keep uh, people you don't like from doing things in general with some threats. Uh, but what you find is that it's gone beyond the stage of just having enough to respond in case somebody attacks China with nuclear weapons. And keep in mind that nobody has ever talked of attacking China. Uh, you know, I don't mind waiting if uh, somebody wants to go find a name, but nobody's ever talked about that. So for the longest time, it was thought China has two, maybe 300 nuclear weapons. That's all they want, just to be able to respond, you know, to be able to deter an attack. And now suddenly the experts have decided, oh, they've got 500. Uh, it's um, And and they're going to have 1,000 by the end of the, uh, the decade. Uh, but one wonders, you know, maybe they've got a lot more than that. You know, because you will note that the analysts, the experts on China um, have generally underestimated the advances in China's military capabilities, and usually by uh, a decade or two at least. 
And say so one does wonder if they've got more. And you'll see now that for a while, when China was operating in the South China Sea, they had enough of a presence just to kind of um, show they were there and that if so, they could cause a little trouble. But as the numbers have increased, uh, the numbers of ships, uh, the numbers of aircraft, their capabilities, now they've kind of gone on the offensive and they're pushing the Filipinos. They are uh, all over Japanese southern islands, uh, really threatening the, the Japanese. And they've got a capability, the hardware, uh, the know-how to actually do more than just sit back and tell somebody don't try anything, but rather to go out on the offensive. And that's what you're seeing. And so with nuclear weapons, I would say it's the same thing. And if the buildup uh, continues, and as I said, they just might have more than we think they do. Uh, but if they get, say, a, a whole lot of them, one could easily see them thinking, well, you know, we got enough of them that we just might use them. But also mm -hmm. having, say, three, four thousand, five thousand weapons that are ready to nuclear weapons that are ready to use uh, so that you could actually make it so your enemy could not launch a second strike uh, that you just might be tempted to put it into action. Uh, as, as we've seen with their more conventional uh, hardware, where it's, uh, they do have this overwhelming advantage in the South China Sea, for example. So I wouldn't just say it's deterrence, but there is at some stage down the road, the real possibility of uh, actually using them, but also just having so many that any opponent is just going to say, look, there's nothing we can do, you win. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, one does have to keep in mind that they're not just um, sort of sitting back. Uh, and the idea is eventually to uh, assert themselves if necessary. You just mentioned conventional hardware. So let me touch on that next. USNI News reported that another area, I think this is fairly well known, of rapid Chinese buildup is in their Navy, which is expected to grow to 400 hulls in the next two years, according to USNI, up from a strength of 340. Now, as a part of this buildup, they have actually been transferring older Corvette class ships to the Chinese Coast Guard and replacing them with modern multi-role platforms featuring advanced anti-ship, anti-air, and anti-submarine weapons and sensors. So not only are they increasing the Navy, they're also moving older ships that are less capable off, which is making those 400 hulls greatly more formidable than they would otherwise be. Uh, now, do you would you say that this is related to Taiwan tensions, primarily the Taiwan Strait? Or again, is this just building an offensive capability? Now, ultimately, Taiwan's objectives, excuse me, China's objectives go way beyond Taiwan. Taiwan is just at most a stepping stone. Uh, it, rather, these are an, it, sort of global objectives, ultimately, but one step at a time. And it is to be able to op in the case of the Navy to be operate to be able to operate worldwide, uh, starting with the Pacific, but also the Atlantic, uh, the Indian Ocean. And you need a lot of ships to do that. And that is China's intentions. They're building the really the the, heart, the infrastructure to be able to uh, have places around the globe where they can can operate. Uh, their for example, their uh, investments and in, into uh, port operation ports and port operations. Uh, globally. It, it appears commercial, of course, uh, but these work very well for navies. But the Chinese have been very clear about this. And if you read what they say, it's that a country that has global interests, it has to be able to protect them, their overseas interests, and you need a navy to do that. And they are creating a navy with the, the ability to operate far afield. So it's not just warships they're building, but rather things like uh, the, the refueling ships, the logistics ships that you need uh, to be able to keep a, a Navy afloat. And they have made just huge strides in the last 15, 20 years. And it really is just a question of time till they're operating globally the way the Americans do. You know, for the longest time, we were the only show in town and, and we would sort of uh, pat ourselves on the back, rightfully so, that we could send you know, our eight ships, our military anywhere. And they had the ability to operate. Uh, nobody else could do that like us, and the, the Chinese can are, are getting to the point where they will be able to do that. And they are building up ships at just a rapid clip. They're say for every one we make or we launch, they're doing about five or six. And their shipbuilding capability is a, it is impressive. Uh, almost if you look back to what we could do in World War II, uh, 
the Chinese are doing that now. We have allowed our shipbuilding capability to languish to the point that it is, uh, it's not just embarrassing, it is actually uh, frightening when you consider just how uh, behind we are. I would note that the Chinese Coast Guard, which doesn't get counted in that 400 ship figure, uh, their Coast Guard ships, some of the newer ones, are actually bigger than Navy ships of many countries, and even bigger than some of ours, and they're built for war fighting. Additionally, China has a maritime militia, which are effectively double-hauled um, armored uh, fishing boats that work very well for occupying places, intimidating people, and uh, really seizing territory, and working as an adjunct uh, to the other uh, Chinese uh, naval and also sort of, uh, Coast Guard uh, and other official vessels. So the numbers are actually much bigger. Uh, then the 400, it's 350 now, roughly, and there'll be 400. But we are at about 291. I think that's our figure of warships. And that number is going to go down before it goes up a little. Uh, one doesn't need a military background to understand that this isn't exactly where you want to be. In some ways, we've been coasting on our, our laurels. And the U.S. Yeah. Navy, is, uh, you know, who the guys running the show, and that's the admirals over the last 20 plus years, uh, they've allowed this to happen. And yet uh, there's been no real concern. There's no, you know, they go on to board memberships and uh, nice pensions. And now we've got a Navy that can barely hold its own if it uh, if it can. And the submarine, our submarine forces are last ace in the hole, but we don't have as many of those as we need. And, and our allies are not going to fill up the gap the way people think they will. Uh, so the... the situation, the comparison of the two navies does give, it reflects the, the larger uh, trends in the so-called correlation of forces, kind of who's got more of what and is able to use it. And we're not moving in the right direction, the Chinese are. Uh, and th that's one has, doesn't like to say it, but that's where we are. And there, I would note there is no plan afoot to rebuild our navy in the way that it should be as or, or as fast as it needs to. A lot of talking about it, but there's still no plan. Uh, as yeah. amazing as that is. So, you know, it's that well, the good news is just piles up one after the other. And, and Grant, now you, you had mentioned instances of intimidation and coercion. That is something that was also cited in the Department of Defense 2023 Military Power Report. In basically, they discussed increasing PRC military coercion, and they stated, quote unquote, in 2022, the PRC adopted more dangerous, coercive, and provocative actions in the Indo-Pacific region. For example, and they list some instances here, between the fall of 2021 and 2023, the U.S. documented over 180 instances of PLA coercion and risky air intercepts against U.S. aircraft in the region. Over the same period, the PLA also conducted about 100 instances of coercive and risky operational behavior in the air domain against U.S. allies and partners. So in, a cre in addition to increasing its military capabilities, it appears that China also continues to be more aggressive in its military posturing as well, right? They're, they're pushing the limits. And again, it seems like when you have things like shadowing, you have these risky air intercepts. If something goes wrong, it seems like that could touch off a war, right? It could. Uh, you know, one never quite knows how these will play out. I, you know, at this point, I'm sometimes at the, the point of thinking that there's no limit uh, to how much we will back off in the face of clear provocations. Uh, but that said... Uh, what you've described in, is is what's going on. And it's been going on for a few years at least uh, it, at this scale. It's not new. Uh, and the most recent example was one where a Chinese fighter uh, intercepted an American B-52 over the South China Sea at night. And the Chinese fighter came within 10 feet of the B-52. Now, hold your arms out in both directions, and that's maybe four or five feet. So do that twice. And that's about how close it came. This is asking for trouble. And it's not an accident. All of these things are uh, intentionally. And it is as though the PRC is looking for a fight. You don't do this sort of thing 
if you're not expecting trouble. And they apparently are not very afraid of us if they're willing to do this. And other examples, I think it was in Australia, uh, the Chinese dropped uh, chaff in front of it, which could have gone into the engines, brought down the plane. And this is just one example. The Canadians have been roughed up like this as well. The Japanese have been on the receiving end. China's, Chinese have been using lasers uh, against American pilots and other foreign pilots as well, uh, going back some years. And the excuse that we always hear is, well, it's just some rogue commander down, in the, down south and central government just has no idea what he's doing. Uh, well, in this system, there's no upside to taking the initiative like that. In that Chinese system, if you do that, you're not going to be around long. Uh, yeah. So yeah. it is clear that the, the China, this is what, the central government, the central party wants. Well, and you ask yourself, you know, certainly they don't, you know, want to start a fight. Well, maybe they do, but you, and they, particularly when it comes to the Japanese, you know, around with the Japanese, the Chinese ships, uh, pressuring the Japanese around the Senkaku Islands, very southernmost Japan, the J Chinese would love nothing more than the Ch Japanese to fire just one shot. Uh, and they would be all over them. And I would say they are indeed um, sort of throwing down the gauntlet and telling the Americans, what are you going to do about it? You're seeing it around the Philippines too, uh, with the harassment of Chinese, of, excuse me, of Philippine vessels, daring the Americans to come out and and fight or do and something. They don't, I don't think they're afraid of us. And that's not a good position to be in. That goes directly to my next question. So Wu Qian the spokesperson for China's defense ministry responded to the Pentagon's 2023 military power report by calling the United States the quote unquote biggest disruptor of regional peace and stability in the world. And then stating, we urge the U.S. to stop using any excuse, any method to strengthen the U.S.-Taiwan military links and illegally arm Taiwan. So rather than actually responding to the rapid military buildup in China, they turned that around and accused the United States of, of you know, quote unquote, illegally arming Taiwan. Um, it, to me, that sounded like wolf warrior diplomacy. And again, it almost sounds like picking a fight. Well, it is. It, and it's, I think, um, some people would call it projection, um, where the Chinese are, they're telling you what they're doing and saying you're the ones who are doing it. I think gaslight, what they call it, gaslighting is the, the popular word these days. And there's many Americans who think, yeah, we kind of, say in that ruling class who thinks about foreign affairs, who think, yeah, we are being provocative. Um, but then the Chinese use it, they say that because it works well with a certain slice of uh, the commentariat and our official class. Um, but you have to ask yourself, you know, look back say 30, 40, 50 years, and there has never been a country more welcome into the, the global system, the Western system, uh, than China. Now, they were allowed into World Trade Organization despite meeting none of the requirements. Uh, they have been given every advantage. And, and when they do things that, that are wrong, nobody says anything. There's been no punishment for that. As I say, the idea was that they will become like us or they'll become like Canadians if we just accommodate them. Uh, they get wealthier, that they'll see there's no threat to them, and everything will be good. Well, it was obvious about 20 years ago, this was not happening, probably longer, actually. Uh, and what you're seeing now is a normal reaction as the some of the, uh, say, the Americans and some other countries are kind of waking up. But this hasn't worked. We had better defend defend ourselves and defend it, not just ourselves, but the interests, the the, the ideas that we stand for. And now China, in the, the classic sort of behavior of any bully uh, is, well, you, you know, why are you, you know, you're, you're picking on me, you're provoking me because you're defending yourself. And we've seen this before. And so much of this is the sort of behavior that one observes in the playground when you're about five years old. Uh, it's really not all that complicated, um, but it, it's working uh, somewhat, you know, for the, the Chinese, but they've always got a constituency. And I'll just talk about the United States that is very willing to not just see the Chinese position, but to think the Chinese position is the correct one. But when you, when you listen to these, these statements, uh, it can be infuriating, but you do get kind of used to it. 
but it's important to realize that there is simply no truth uh, to it. And as I said earlier, uh, nobody I've ever heard has said we should attack China. Um, who were Chinese en China's enemies? Well, really nobody. In fact, everybody's just wishing they would have behaved uh, differently. Uh, but China has no enemies other than the ones they have created. And this is something that you know human beings that we've seen throughout history is uh, a country wants more. It wants other people's stuff and it's willing to play rough to get it. Uh, and it's a question, will, will we defend ourselves or won't we? Uh, but the I would also encourage people to read Chinese, the English translations of the Chinese media just for a few days. And you will get a tone of, you'll get a sense of things, a very clear sense of what the tone of the, the Chinese discourse is towards the West, towards the United States, towards the Japanese. And it is just vitriolic and venomous. Uh, you won't find anything good said. Uh, the only thing you might say uh, sort of optimistically is, well, China says, well, if uh, we do, you know, if you want good, you know, we want good relations, we want a win-win situation, but it's always if you want good relations with us, do exactly what we say. And that's how it works. And some things are about that simple. And there's so much empirical evidence as to what's going on here that any sort of excuse of not knowing or things being unclear, uh, that's long gone, uh, in my opinion. China has spoken at length about peace on the international stage, but they appear to be rapidly arming and mobilizing their military. Are they preparing for war? Yes. Uh, it may be uh, a war of a certain kind that we don't predict. And everybody who, all the, uh, the pundits, of which I suppose I'm one, uh, everyone can lay out the scenario. And there's probably a good dozen or so that, the, uh, that makes sense. Uh, Taiwan gets attention, and Philippines, etc. cetera. Uh, but you don't build up a military like this unless you're intending to use it. And particularly when you don't face any enemies. Uh, and you have to conclude they are getting ready for war. They understand their shortcomings and they have created a People's Liberation Army. Uh, it's the, the PLA, uh, Air, Army, Air Force, Navy. Uh, that is actually pretty good. Uh, and it is designed to... Uh, do one thing in particular, and that is to defeat the United States. Uh, and if you can take us on, if you can uh, sort of get the Americans out of the way, the rest is easy. But it is a it is a competent military. It's got shortcomings, make no mistake. It can't project power all that far off of the, the Chinese coast yet. As I'd say, it's pretty good within about a thousand miles, although the missiles go farther. But just keep it up. And they are getting better and better and better at it. And once again, you have to ask yourself why. Uh, and if you read Xi Jinping's speeches, and if you actually read his predecessor's speeches as well, and it's pretty clear uh, what's going on. And the idea is that the uh, you have competing systems and only one of them can survive. One of these is the Chinese socialist communist system. The other is the Western system. And this has actually been referred to as the enemy. Uh, the ideas that we take for granted about individual liberty, etc., human rights. Um, the Chinese have been very clear that uh, Xi Jinping as well, that these are anathema. And there's only going to be one, one survivor, one winner. Uh, and China expects that it will be it. And they are building up a military, which is what you have to have uh, to get your way. So I'm afraid that it is about it is about that serious. Um, I do still hear some American senior officers uh, saying, "Oh, if only the Chinese would tell us their int intentions," and you wonder what exactly the requirements are to be promoted to admiral or general if you can't figure out what the Chinese are up to. Um, they must think that in some ways we're luring them into this uh, very sophisticated trap because nobody could be this dumb. Uh, but you still hear it, not as often as you did. Um, but the Chinese have been very clear. You just have to listen to them. And uh, it's, it's been said uh, that the Chinese always telegraph their punches. That's what James Lilly used to say. And it's true. They always tell you what they're going to do. And if you're not listening, and uh, well, you're going to get in trouble. Grant, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. And again, for your career of remarkable service. Uh, so again, your book is When China Attacks, Warning to America. I'm going to put links to this in the show note. 
And let me close by asking, what comes next for you? What will you be up to in the beginning part of 2024? And what do you see for the already tense China-U.S. international situation, I guess, in the early part of 2024 as well? Well, I think it's going to get rough. Uh, exactly how, I'm not sure. Taiwan's getting a lot of attention, of course, but elsewhere in the South China Sea. Uh, but China is also very happy to see a number of brush fires that have been popping up around the world. They've been glad to egg that to sort of help stoke them. Uh, Ukraine, Gaza, uh, Latin America, Venezuela, uh, Cuba, Nicaragua, uh, all of Latin America. You've got Chinese activity, the Central Pacific, where Chinese influence operations have just been immense. Uh, you're putting the Americans in a position where they're like the, the Dutch boy with a lot of leaks springing in the, the dikes and can only handle so many. So they're glad to see us stretched. And I think you're also going to see uh, domestically in the United States with an election coming up. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a reprise of the summer of 2020 with sort of riots on demand. Uh, but things are going to get nasty. And once again, this is all a nice distraction from the PRC's perspective. So I wouldn't be surprised to see them, as I say, really exert themselves militarily and if necessary, do some shooting uh, when it comes around uh, Taiwan, uh, Philippine territory, and maybe even go after the Japanese. But you know, they also may just say, well, let's let things simmer because things are working pretty well for us. But as I think things are going to get rough. And I, and I must say that I've never been as concerned as I am today. Um, as for me, what I'm going to be doing, um, this book I wrote was um, a much, it was a shock to the system because I thought it would take a couple of weekends at the double wide trailer down in North Carolina and it, it didn't. Uh, it was a lot of work, uh, but maybe there's another book coming and we'll see. But also there's plenty to, uh, plenty to write about and I've sort of gotten behind a bit, um, but you know, it'll be a very interesting year. I, I like reading about history and wars and stuff but I prefer when it's other people and it's ancient history. I prefer when it's not you know, directly involving us, uh, but we'll see how it goes. We'll see. Thank you again so much for your time today, sir. My pleasure. Glad to be here. I appreciate it.